I was pinged by people a week or so ago, and the quote was that you don't believe companies should be able to buy each other, and they wanted me to talk to you about this. Yeah, persuade me out of it. I've, I don't like it. <clears throat> what do you not like about it? I just I don't like I don't like the idea that like a person's goal is to like start a company and then sell it to a bigger company. Um, I feel like the vertical and horizontal reach that so many companies have now across like sectors just feels super fucking toxic and not like a good business environment. Like when I'm thinking of like competition between different manufacturers, between different stages of the supply chain, between different people that are selling goods or services to consumers, I'm not thinking like one guy can just buy up every single thing that um, that that comes along to make their company the best thing it can be. It just feels stupid to me. Like Google shouldn't be making cell phones and ad service and email and like every mm -hmm. like yeah. That's right. Go ahead. Yeah. I don't have like a strong sense on it. it. Just it feels like revolting. But maybe there's like a good reason why it has to be this way or something. Well, I mean, I think that, um, so I would just say that there's utility to, of course, gen generally like private allocation of capital, yeah. right? That, you know, when, when owners of businesses can decide what to do with that ownership, it, it can lead to good outcomes. Yeah. Um, you know, a couple examples would be like, you know, a company that, uh, has lower access to capital, but has a good idea. You know, they can sell that idea to a bigger company that has better access to capital and expand. Yeah, but on I feel like idea, there's a difference right? between like access to capital versus like companies just buying you. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with like capital investment. I'm not like full on socialist now, where I don't think anybody should be able to invest. I just don't like the idea of like large companies buying up other companies to improve their product or service. Right, right. Okay, so you should be able to raise okay, money. So you're yeah, for sure, yeah. Well, yeah, but raising capital is like part of that could be an equity deal with another big company, right? So like, for instance, yeah, one example is, um, or God, I mean, that's, yeah, that's on. what I'm talking about clearly, right? Like, I, like you should be able to raise capital. I know that other companies could also invest in other companies, but I'm saying that that's, I don't like that model of like companies investing and buying parts of their supply chain and shit. I just don't like that. Right. Okay. So you're, so you're, it sounds like the big thing is a vertical integration, right? Vertical like and horizontal. Start. Yeah. But yes. Yeah. Okay, sure. Well, I mean, it sounds like, okay, yeah, because what I was quoted was like, Destiny just doesn't think any company should buy any other company, <laughs> which sounds like I mean, that's kind a of less to, defensible. Yeah, to a normal person, I would say that, but to, yeah, I mean, like, obviously, like, private equity or, like, investment or hedge funds are, are going to be a little bit different than what I'm talking about, right? Like, Amazon buying, like, trucks and grocery stores or Google buying, like, doing phones and, you know, everything else. Right, or like a, I don't know, like a small landscape, like the guy who owns a small landscaping company is selling his business to some conglomerate and retiring or something yeah. yeah yeah like that's probably a little bit you know that's a little bit different i see what you're saying i mean like i mean obviously i don't think it's not that these companies in my view shouldn't be allowed to do that right like if google wants to you know for instance like if google sees a change in business model or like a value opportunity i think them like buying assets and trying to buy talent to maintain that competitive edge or like for instance like say a, a company like shell you know big oil company realizes that the energy transition's happening you know them being able to purchase renewable energy talent and you know different companies and you know energy transition people so that they can grow that within their company instead of having to sort of get all these oil people to now do renewables that's probably an easier transition than you know, somehow being able, you know, paying okay, wait, consultants, hold, yeah, I, I guess. Understand. Hold on. Let's skip all the boring parts. Obviously, I'm not like, obviously, horizontal and vertical integration of companies represents a huge interest to the companies and it can represent the huge interest to the consumers, right? We both agree with that, obviously, right? And integration is going to smooth a lot of these things out. Sure. It's going to make things better for everybody, of course, right? Do you understand the negatives of what I'm talking about? That it feels weird that we have so many markets yeah. where, it feel, like, how does Facebook buy Instagram, right? Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Or, or, or how do you get these, like, huge mergers where, like, uh, how do you ever have a market like Intel control, like, 96% of like CPUs or NVIDIA controls like 92% of like GPUs or like a company like Google or Amazon is allowed to buy any company ever, right? It's just, like yeah. I understand that it can, it represents like some fluidity in their transactions within the company and then to customers as well. But it feels like we're, we're like, we're way past like anything that I would ever consider like monopoly or oligop, not oligopoly, monopoly or um, what do you call it when multiple companies are kind of in control of it? Like two or three companies has oligopoly. Okay. Yeah. yeah oligopoly. Yeah. It just seems insane to me. Like, I don't know what, I don't know what antitrust means yeah. in the entire, in the United States right now. I have no idea what that means. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's like I think Google it's fair buying to ways. Yeah, 
I, oh yeah, because I went to use Waze like a year ago and I noticed that. How the fuck does Google buy <laughs> Waze? That's insane to me, right? I, I don't understand yeah, it at all. Or like Google getting into phones and getting into AI. You know, they're getting, there's just big companies getting yeah, into everything. Yeah, make a new company like, for it. Break them up, Amazon. do it, do it with something different, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I think that's a much more fair statement to say that some of these big companies should be broken up or like there should be, um, you know, more sort of regulatory scrutiny on that kind of thing. I mean, I think that's part of what, um, like, I think, for instance, did the Bi I think the Biden admin blocked a big merger somewhat. I think it was maybe the Time Warner Comcast merger or something. There, there's some big merger, I think, that Biden's we admin like came in and We had, like, three ISPs in the United States. These ISPs shouldn't be merging with anybody ever. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. I mean, part of it is just the administration, right? So, like, I think that, uh, for instance, Clinton went after Microsoft for antitrust, and then Bush came in and said, you know, we're cool with that, and mm -hmm. we're, we're just going to drop all the investigations, right? And so, um, and at the time, Microsoft had, like, a pretty powerful monopoly on personal computers, right? This, what was they this? still this do, was right? Isn't, like, 90% of computers still, like, Microsoft computers, Windows computers? Um, I honestly don't know how the market share has changed over time. I really don't. I think the problem, the problem with, um, the problem that the Clinton administration, uh, kind of pointed out was, and this was the basis of their investigation, wasn't necessarily just the market share. It was that, um, they were pairing their market share with ancillary products. So basically they tried to boost Internet Explorer because they had this huge market share of, of personal desktops. And... Basically, that was an example of where a company is trying to take advantage of their monopoly power. Yeah, of course. To I try mean, like, and, look at, you know. It sounds like kind of shitty, but like, um, like, honest to God, I don't think I would ever buy a non Android phone if a competitor came out just because the integration that Google offers is so good. But like, that's kind of fucked up. That's kind of stupid, right? Like, Apple it should, that offers. should ever. Yeah, same yeah. thing with Apple as well. Apple is highly vertically integrated with their software and hardware. So it's like, would you ever yeah. buy if you if you're part of the iPhone ecosystem or if you're part of the Google ecosystem, you're like locked in. But not because they're making the yeah. best products, they've got the most innovative things. It's just because you're locked in vertically to, to ancillary products like you're saying. Yeah, it's yeah. It just seems so stupid. No, that makes it's sense. Like, right, I mean, it's, just, it's the yeah. same thing as like no, it's the same thing as like Tesla um how like only like suppose it like oh yes, for some reason only a Tesla charger should be able to charge a Tesla, you know, electric vehicle. And it's like this is just clearly a way to take advantage of their market power in EVs, right? Mm -hmm. Because, yeah. you know, you have to use Tesla chargers for your fucking Tesla, yeah. right? When that doesn't really make any sense, there should probably be like a, you know, a similar, like how all the, like all your home outlets are all interchangeable, mm -hmm. right? You, you don't have like a fucking Apple branded home outlet. It's all the same shit, right? Um, that's true, not yet. I'm not yeah. sure if smart homes, you know, Apple sponsored corporate, uh, you know, ho neighborhoods are a thing at this point, but, um, but no, I mean that obviously that's a more defensible position. People were pinging me like Destiny just doesn't believe in the concept of mergers and acquisitions, which, which is sure. I mean, uh, like obviously yeah, there's some but, things, but yeah. Do do you agree that well, I, I don't I don't like this idea, right? Like I'm gonna make a company so that I can get it big and sell it to a bigger company, like like a huge mm -hmm. company. I just, I don't like that approach to yeah. I, I just feel like yeah, it's like, unhealthy economic activity. I don't think it's a good way to go. Like I mean, like I don't well, I'm not, I don't hurt, I don't hate the business owners of the business or whatever. I just I feel like it's not healthy for like a uh, good markets. But yeah, go ahead, sir. Well, it's not just unhealthy. I mean, it could literally be like a scam, right? I mean, look at like WeWork is an example of. It seemed <laughs> like WeWork was an example where this guy basically said. Okay, I've got a like a 10% of a good idea. I'm gonna try and go public, and then it's someone else's problem because I'll go public and just cash out sure. and fuck everybody else. This business model is probably not that profitable, right? Yeah. Um, and you saw something uh, sort of similar when Lyft and Uber went public, right? Was that um, you had a bunch of like original investors cashing out on the IPO, mm -hmm. and then basically the public shareholders were now on the hook for this now more transparent business model and, and it turns out well it's not actually very profitable at all yeah right like i don't know um, how many like you see that a lot with tech companies yeah yeah especially i was gonna say i don't know how many silicon valley guys you know but you're never gonna have a competitor to google because when you start a company your goal is to like sell to google or to sell to some other large like you know software company like that's the goal <laughs> so like you're, you're never gonna see competition um for, for any of these products because why would you you're, you're trying to sell to these guys you know yeah, yeah. I mean, that's totally fair. I think um, it sounds like it sounds like you're. It sounds like you would say that almost uh, like there should probably be a more expansive view because typically, I think most of the time monopolies. Well, yeah, like most of the time monopolies can get away with being monopolies as long as 
y- you know, as long as generally consumers are pretty happy with the product and they don't sort of incredibly overtly take advantage of their monopoly power, right? Um, you know, this is where you see like Standard Oil getting in trouble. Like Standard Oil comes in, buys all the fucking oil companies, and then raises the prices, right? But you know, yeah. if you're offering a competitive product, worrying. still. I'm worried about the opportunity upset. cost, though, right? Because it's the idea that, like, we're not going to see a bunch of competing operating systems, which might be, like, really cool. We're not going to really see right. a bunch of, like, competing phone brands, which might be really cool. We're just going to see, um, yeah, like, people trying to sell to big tech companies and the people building around these pre-existing products, basically. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's that's understandable. I think that, um, I, think I, think that I think the more interesting question is, like, the utility of just more heavily regulating or socializing those companies versus actually just breaking them up because i can imagine i can imagine some industries where some monopoly is probably okay right like it's there actually might be utility to some industries being quasi monopolies right i think that sports leagues are a good example now those are technically trade organizations but essentially the nfl is like a monopoly on playing football professionally and that's kind of cool because you get all the best football players all playing with each other Right. You don't want to have like, you know, the NBA, like you don't want to have like LeBron James and fucking like Kyrie Irving in separate leagues because you want to see them play together. Um, And so just heavily regulating that versus breaking it up probably makes more sense. Or like social media could be another example where, you know, it's it might be okay to have a few big social media companies because you have everyone kind of on the same company and you don't have to download like 30 different apps. Right. Um, But obviously that's a you know, that's a different conversation. I think the general principle, though, that you're outlining which is that yeah these companies are probably too big right and there should probably be antitrust uh regulations or some sort of uh you know socialization uh, or, or something like that that happens uh, i think that could make sense yeah i don't think i necessarily disagree well there you go there you go dusty see everybody was telling me you just didn't believe in MA. I i was like well that doesn't seem that doesn't seem like a good a good position um yeah. And uh, I wanted to talk. I, I've heard I heard you talk about your uh, your hesitancy to mention or to 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 talk to Matt Brunig, and I just don't. I, why do you not want to talk to Matt Brunig? Because I, I think I, it would like, be a why? super interesting conversation. Would it be? I think so personally. I mean, to be fair, like obviously that's me saying that. Like I just like economics and you know socialist and capitalist style like conversations and discussions. Um, okay. They're like the most but, like agonizingly boring conversations in the world to me. I guess. I don't know. I mean, but it, it seemed like there. I don't. I don't remember what years the, these were. I don't know. Say like twenty nineteen to twenty twenty one. I don't know how many times you had like the socialism debate with various different people, but. Um, I mean, were the, were all those conversations just not fun, or like, why'd you why'd you do them? You know, um, or was it like a phase? Like at the time they were fun, and now it's just like, fuck, I've had this same conversation like a hundred times at this point. Why did we do them? I think it's just because I usually got attacked by those communities so much, and it was a way to demonstrate that they were fucking stupid. But the <laughs> reason why I um. The reason why I, I fell out of favor of like having those types of debates is just because it just feels like so ungrounded, like, like the like none of it is like policy, like none of it has anything to do with like anything happening in the real world. Like it's just so. Oh my god! What destiny? This is the thing, though. This is why Matt Brunig is like the one guy you might be able to have a good conversation with, because he's like, I mean, he's he. I don't know if you know really much about Matt Brunig or who he is, right? But I mean, I see him um, post on Twitter. A lot. Everything I see him post on Twitter seems pretty cool. Like, I don't, I don't think well, I've yeah, ever he, seen him post, like, retarded shit or anything. Yeah, he's not, like, he's not, a, he's not stupid. That's probably the most important thing. But mm-hmm. he, he started a think tank. Uh, he start, he's, he has his own think tank, basically. And he, he does different publications and briefs for different members of Congress and political figures and whoever mm-hmm. might buy his research. I'm not sure. And um, he's very data-oriented. And I don't agree with everything he says. I mean, he, he talks about having, like, universal socialized capital ownership, which I think is a little bit suspect. But it is to say, though, that I, I have had similar conversations with assorted socialists online, you know, I don't know, Vosh and like various other, you know, smaller and bigger socialist content creators. And none of them had a very, I, I get what you're saying. None of them had, in my view, a very well thought out model of socialism. It yeah. just, a lot of it just seemed very susceptible to structural critiques in in a way that is either demonstrating economic illiteracy or in a way that's demonstrating almost like 
just ideological yeah, like I'm positions. euphorically attached to this like position and I don't care if it works or doesn't work right. or anything right. I don't understand about it. And so the that's where I think Matt Brunig is interesting because he advocates for uh, sort of mixed model socialist production, right? So like a mixture of cooperative ownership and I would say mostly sovereign wealth fund ownership, right? Just having yeah. But then you know, my the guess government. is going to be that for conversations relating to stuff like, especially like sovereign wealth funds, it's probably going to be like, oh, this would be a really cool idea. Like, yeah, I think it would be a cool idea. Like, I don't think I've ever heard a good argument against like sovereign wealth funds. They seem cool. But then, like, what do we? Oh, but that, then, like, yeah. what do we talk about? Then we're like, oh, cool, okay, cool. Well, I just think it's a good perspective, right? I think that Matt Brunig is an interesting guy just because his perspective on. Socialism is relatively well informed and grounded and data oriented, right? So if if the big problem with talking to socialists, which I kind of agree with, is that a lot of them are not very economically illiterate or very well sort of empirically grounded in their positions, then that's totally reasonable. Yeah, right? that, Matt Brunig doesn't fall the, the, into the that second, problem. Yeah, I agree with that because, um, like I said, I've never seen him say anything really stupid before. But the second part was the um, that like policy wise like we're not very close to any of it and the stuff that we are close to it doesn't have much at all to do with socialism and i'm okay to i guess like chat about that stuff but then like i don't think we're gonna disagree on much it's gonna be yeah again like i said it's gonna be like oh i think social wealth funds are a good idea it's like oh yeah they seem like pretty cool i mean like if we could ever get one that's fine but i mean like this country seems allergic to anything with social anything in it but yeah that's fair i mean if if uh i guess it depends on because like so it sounds like you don't want to so you don't want to talk to people who are just like informative. It's you, you. You really want to have like these more contentious conversations. You know what I mean? Or stuff that is at least like more grounded in like this is happening right now, and these are like real things that we yeah. need to like worry about. Yeah. That's why like even like okay. debating like Nick on uh, Fuentes on like the fucking like Christian nationalism shit is like okay like. Um, I don't. I mean, I don't know. Like so Matt Brunig is a reformist type kind of socialist. I mean, he just believes in kind of electoralism and having these sovereign wealth funds pop up. I mean, I think that what he would argue is that a lot of the models he advocates for are actually actually are already happening, right? So, you know, if you look at, I mean, most, not, I don't want to say most countries, but like there's a significant number of countries that have huge, huge sweeping sovereign wealth funds, or like there's these subnational sovereign wealth funds that are very, very influential, right? And this is, you know, socialized capital ownership, right? And he would just argue for expanding that model. And I think that's where the conversation could get interesting of, well, how expansive could we could we really go with this model? And that's kind of where my conversation with him led was his argument is that you could socialize basically all capital under sovereign wealth fund ownership. Um, whereas my thought is that 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 probably wouldn't work because <laughs> you just end up with overinvestment and like probably not great incentives. You, you probably need at least a little private capital investment allocation. Um, but anyway, that's that's all to say that I think this would be a a good conversation and relatively informative for you and the audience as well. Cause I think that it's fair based on the conversations you've had. I've probably watched like every debate you've had with the socialists. It's probably fair to come across as like, damn, all these socialists are fucking completely stupid <laughs> because a lot sure. of the people you've talked to about socialism are, um, but Matt Brunig, I will say is, is he's one of the good ones. And he's also changed, uh, he's, he's changed a, a number of my positions, right? Um, uh, just through, because he doesn't only talk about socialism, he talks about, well, I think probably his two main subjects are welfare policy and socialism. And I think that um, his welfare policy is like, I mean, some of, some of the best research on welfare policy that I've seen, um, or like, if you wouldn't call it, because he, he's not like an academic, but he does you know, these sort of uh, j j just like anal analysis of welfare and welfare policy, which I think is pretty good. Um, he's a big universal welfare person. Um, and he changed my mind on that topic. You know, having means testing versus universal welfare uh, was a pretty good um, was a pretty good uh, little paper that he had. And I thought it was pretty informative. Um, it's the same thing. Like, uh, I, like I'll, I'll set the conversation up. But what it's going to be is him going like, "Oh, this is going to be like, oh, I agree." And I was like, "Oh, this is okay, I agree." Like that would be like the whole conversation. If he wants to, <laughs> then you can tell him like to DM me, and we'll set it up. But that's that's going to be the entire conversation. There's like, there's not like even what you're saying, like arguing between different types of social wealth funds when we're probably 50 years away minimum in the U.S. from having a social wealth fund is like it's like the most boring conversation in the world to me. But mm -hmm. if he wants to, I mean, I we can. So. But it's just like it's so far removed from like anywhere we're at politically in the United States. It's like okay, it's like it's like know, it feels like arguing over flavors of communism or socialism. We, we, we don't have a really, public option in the United States. How many so, how many countries with social wealth funds like have completely privatized like healthcare systems like we do, or or mostly privatized healthcare systems like we do? 
Well, I mean, I think uh, I, I'm not I'm really not sure the answer to that question. I mean, I, I think that um, if you look at like Singapore, Singapore has a pretty big sovereign wealth fund and they have, you know, this mixed model healthcare system. Um, that's one example off the top of my head. Um, and I think pretty much every country who espouses who says they have single payer has sort of private options and some private allocation of healthcare. Um, but I don't know. I, I think that's the interesting thing about his model, though, is that there there's there's many state level and local examples of essentially public publicly run investment funds, which is all a sovereign wealth fund is. Right. I mean, any time of like when you hear like the New York City fucking fire department pension fund, well, that's that's just a, a wealth fund that's for a specific purpose. But that's government managed investment, essentially. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing like the Ontario's the Ontario's teacher pension. Like that's one of the biggest uh, you could say subnational sovereign wealth funds in the world, mm -hmm. right? Universities have endowment funds. Those are it's the same thing, right? That that, that is a publicly managed investment fund for a uh, a government service, right? Which is public education, right? Yeah. Um, and so the uh, idea of like, like hey, expanding we... those things, yeah. So I think with like expanding right, right. things like Medicare, like programs that already work to make them more encompassing and to include more people, yeah. No, that's what that's what I'm saying though. That's, is that I don't I don't think I really don't think it's that unrealistic to say you know we should have. Uh, a national level sovereign wealth fund. I think, it, I mean, it was just proposed recently. I think it was a bipartisan proposal to take, I want to say it was uh, Social Security, the Social Security Trust Fund, and just diversify it into different equities and real estate. I mean, that's a sovereign wealth fund for the United States, right? It's just based on the, the pension system of the US. Um, now, the more like, you know, other stuff of, you know, I don't know, having like a land value tax and giving you know diversifying that and giving a dividend out or you know having a nationalizing resource wealth and then taking those pro you know that's probably i would agree that's probably a little bit of a ways away at this point but um in general anyway i just think it'd be an interesting conversation um and uh, uh i think it, it uh, you know the audience might uh, they might like it or they might hate it i'm not sure how they'll feel but uh, who knows um okay my eyes open for but, okay all right. I'll, either well, then explain I'll, what a wealth fund is. So it's the idea that like you have like some sort of public investment in large companies, um, and the idea being that like if large companies in your country are succeeding, everybody in the country kind of gets a share of that. It's a really good idea because we should feel invested in our average American companies. But right now, the average American has no access to to the wealth that Facebook is generating. Whereas if we had like a public wealth fund that all citizens like got a dividend fund from or something like that, I don't know exactly how you'd want to do it. But basically, yeah. it should be that like as these companies gain in value, every American should feel like they're gaining in value too. But that's a total disconnect. Yeah. yeah. It's just it's just the it's socializing the capital returns of equities and real estate and things like that, yeah. right? And putting it towards some public purpose. I mean, I think that it's really interesting because I think it was Matt Brunner or someone else that made this point that um the most socialist stuff on Bernie Sanders' platform was the stuff that nobody gave a shit about. Like, he wasn't really criticized. Yeah, Bernie like, Sanders heavily. was a fucking... Re he wasn't even a socialist. I don't know why he took the branding. It was so toxic. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, no, I totally agree. I don't mm -hmm. think calling yourself a socialist in America is probably a great idea. But I was saying that, it, you know, if socialism is basically collective or public ownership of the means of production, the shit on his platform that was those things mm -hmm. weren't the things anybody ever criticized him for or talked about. Like, he had a plan that I would argue is probably not great which is like uh i think it was like big companies have to sell 30 percent of their equity to their workers insane, yeah. um like that's you know i mean that's worker ownership of the means of production but nobody ever talked about that i think yeah. elizabeth warren had something similar it was always like welfare policy that everyone was talking about because in america when you want more welfare that makes you a socialist yeah. but all the actual like production organization changes it seems like those regulations were never really harshly scrutinized and i think part of that is because Something like a sovereign wealth fund is, you can make a conservative argument for it, right? Yeah, you I can mean, make any. Red I mean, conservative said, right? Like, yeah, like Trump yeah. made arguments for protectionism coming off of like the neocon era of like big business is king, right? So I mean, yeah, you can make whatever argument you want. Nobody believes in actual fucking anything. So yeah. Oh hey, um, on globalism, uh, Econoboy, it seems like glo uh, the idea of globalism, uh, at least as a political tool, is kind of dying. What are your thoughts on that? Because like I've just been listening to some economics, and I just. Yeah. I don't know how to parse what it is or isn't true because it seems like economics in general has to come to some pretty hard truths over like COVID and over the past like five years. When you say globalism as a political tool, what do you what do you mean by that? Um, yeah, so like there was this idea in the uh, 
like 90s and early 2000s that as China grew and became more integra integrated with the global markets, it would become more democratic uh, and we would export our values along with our money into their markets. Am I yeah, like I think that? that no, no, no. I, I, I remember. I, I've never heard it used in that way. I've, uh, it, I, fuck. What was? I can't remember. There's, a, there's an actual like concept for what you're talking about. But I, I know what you're talking about. Um, I mean that theory. The problem with that theory is that it's proven. It's just there's a lot of examples of it kind of working and not working, right? So like you can look at like the Asian tigers are examples of, you know, Hong Kong is not very democratic, but that's because of China's overreach. But like Taiwan and South Korea, as they economically developed, became more democratic. Right. But then like China seems to be going almost the opposite direction. Right. Um, so I think I think that that theory has been proven uh, false. Right. That it turns out just economic growth and like generic economic prosperity doesn't necessarily cause people to be more democratic. Um, there's some theories of democratization that claim the opposite. Right. They'll use uh, like Singapore as an example where uh, the government of Singapore is a. Uh, let's say nominally democratic it's sort of like a hungarian style democracy where they have like the ruling party has like really strict controls on opposition party speech and media but opposition parties can run right it's like a it's a fair election but it's not free if that makes any sense oh, and yeah. um though and like singapore is an example where people don't but at the same time people don't really hate that because the government of singapore is not very corrupt and they deliver pretty good government services through economic development and investment. And so to some degree, if a more authoritarian government proves that they're at least competent at being a government, people won't necessarily hate it, right? Or if democratic institutions are viewed as being unstable, like during the, I think it was like during the 80s and 90s in Latin America, when there was like so much instability in Latin American governments of you know, democracies, military coups, back to democracies, but the democracies were super corrupt. There's a significant portion, uh, there's interesting polling where people in Latin American countries, um, majorities or like significant pluralities of people actually preferred military rule because they just viewed the military government as being better at providing government services Doesn't and that providing happen stability. in Turkey a little bit where like the military steps in to kind of like put the pump the brakes on like coups and shit from... Oh, right, right. I mean, some people view democracies as unstable and corrupt because sometimes democracies are unstable and corrupt in these developing countries, right? Um, and uh, so anyway, that's just a long explanation for that. I kind of agree with you, Forethought, that, you know, the, the theory of just, you know, just, just open up trade and open up borders and that'll create, you know, more robust democracies doesn't really seem to be true. Um, you probably need more. You need more than just that. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with your mom. How? <laughs> yeah. So sorry. <laughs> True. Um, a lot of it has to do with institution building, right? And how you root out corruption in government, um, and, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 how you uh, engender confidence in the government from people. Like one of the problems with like Afghanistan's democracy after the Taliban fell in the early 2000s was that it was really corrupt and it wasn't really a well-functioning government. And so of course nobody voted in the elections, uh, which meant that they didn't have very much democratic legitimacy. Because they didn't, the government of Afghanistan didn't, they weren't a good government, right? Like, nobody's going to vote in your election if they feel like their vote doesn't mean anything and they feel like the government is super corrupt, right? Um, that's one of the problems with the Iraqi democracy right now. It's like the turnout rate's like 30 or 40 percent because nobody really, they just don't really give that much of a shit about who wins the election because the government isn't very stable and doesn't provide, you know, very good government services and it doesn't have very much institutional strength. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, one of the books I'd read on that was, um, I think, was Why Nations Fail. I, I'd read some critique on it, but I didn't find a lot that was uh, made a lot of sense. I saw a lot of historical critique. Do you critique that for, as like as an institutionalist from an economic perspective? That book. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Oh, just as a quick note, academics, it's a rule. As soon as you join academia, you've got to make like this pledge where you hate all generalists and every single fucking discipline ever. So anytime there's a book like why I'm guessing why <laughs> nations fail is probably like a, a generalistly written book that tries to tie together a lot of narratives. Every fucking specialist who's a fucking loser because he has no way to make any of his research like relevant to any individual human and nobody cares what they do will always come out and like criticize like every single fucking thing about it. Just as a heads up. Not to say that it's a good yeah. book or a bad book, but that's like a, there are um, like some books that where that criticism makes a lot of sense. Like Sapiens is um, just fucking horrific. Yeah, like I'm, not saying general, all the, I'm not saying all the criticism are bad. I'm just saying that's a rule. Like, academics will never defend generalist material ever. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ever. So what, what's the, what's like the main 
I haven't read it. I've heard of it. But what's the, what's the main like claims of that book? Oh yeah. Um, the main thrust is that the idea that you can have some sort of uh, predictive power over whether or not a nation will succeed in various markers based on how its institutions are constructed to be open and fair and uh, to be yeah. economically inclusive. Yeah, I mean, based on what you've just told me, I think that's completely correct, right? That, like, the the success of a country or a government is very much dependent on how its different economic and political institutions are set up, right? Um, and you, mm -hmm. can, you can draw the stories of different developing countries that became, like, low-income countries that became middle-income or, like, middle-income countries that became higher-income it does seem to me to be almost entirely a story of institutional strength because a lot of the neoclassical or like Washington consensus analysis just doesn't work, right? Like when you look at developed countries today, none of them use like the Washington consensus, just, oh yes, just completely free flow of capital and, and goods and services. No, like they had industrial policy. Almost every developed country had like very, very strict industrial policy that led to certain investments, specialization of labor, uh, foreign investment capital coming in with limited, uh, let's say, uh, limited rights, right? And then taking that capital, circulating it internally, and then becoming more developed. And a lot of that was on the back of anti-corruption campaigns, transparent government, right? Um, people use the example of Botswana a lot. I think this is a good example because Botswana developed, almost every African nation has certain resource wealth, right? Um, but not every African nation is nearly as rich as Botswana because Botswana, the difference between like a country like Botswana and many of the other surrounding countries is that Botswana, um, there was, there was a guy who came back, became the president of Botswana and he was legitimately a very anti-corruption person. Like he kicked out anybody who was corrupt. He was very much, um, against any sort of graft or, you know, uh, anti-democratic polit political maneuvering or anything like that. And he was able to engage productively with um, private uh, actors in the economy to come into Botswana, mine the resource wealth, but also circulate it internally so they could do things like build schools, educate people, get them the jobs that are productive and, you know, it, just in, in general industrialize the country. And so Botswana is probably the best country in sub-Saharan Africa to live in um, because of those From things. That right? and that's, that's all uh, a story of institutions. Yeah, uh, when you're talking about how they uh, maintain their institutions and recirculate their own money, is that an art? Would you say there's an argument for or against? I mean, would you say there's an argument like for protectionism in developing nations specifically, like the uh, five year plans in South Korea? Yeah, I mean, it's hard because um, it's hard because the word protectionism has such a negative connotation to so many economics people, but the reality is kind of the answer is yes, right? That, I think Japan did um, that. They were like heavily protective of a lot of their electronics industries after World War II and stuff. Yeah. And the, uh, All the, the Asian tigers, was, yeah. all of them as well. It's the same story, right? It's just certain, like, and it depends on what you mean by protectionism, but like, again, um, having some... I like, mean, just the limited... idea, like, you're controlling, you're attempting to maintain internal control over your markets so that they can develop and grow, and they aren't, like, poaching uh, labor, yeah. for instance. Like, that's a huge thing. Well, for instance, it, it, this is an example of Norway, but, and Norway was a developed country at the time, but to be fair, it's, it's, this is an example of the type of, like, you could say protectionist policy that led to long-term, longer-term, more economic prosperity for Norway. Um, I talked to a guy named Lars Doucette, who's like a doppelganger for Destiny, actually, um, to some degree, <laughs> he looks kind of like Destiny. Um, and he's a big Georgist guy, and he's also Norwegian. I mean, he says that Nor Norway's the most Georgist country, but um, when Norway discovered their big oil deposits, um, they had this problem where it's like, okay, well, we know oil is valuable, obviously, but we don't have shit for people to do oil because it's Norway and we didn't have oil until we just discovered it. So there's nobody in the country that can like really work at this oil company, right? If we want to make one. And so what they did was they invited companies in to um, work the oil fields and like set up the initial capital investment. Um, they subsidized capital investment significantly. So, hey, come here, establish wells, start drilling, Shell, Exxon, like all these other oil companies that had expertise. But there's some caveats. Because we're subsidizing a lot of your CapEx and your R&D expenditure, uh, we're going to take a huge royalty. 
right? Huge royalty rates, right? But you're going to take that because you get the other part of the royalty and we're subsidizing your CapEx and R&D. And the other caveats were that you had to hire Norwegian labor, like, I don't know, like 20% of your employees had to be Norwegian or something like that. And that was so that you could start to cultivate the domestic expertise so that eventually Norway could have a well-functioning uh, sort of uh, domestic supply of technical and experienced oil laborers so that they could further socialize that, you know, resource rent in the case of oil, right? And I think that those are examples of, you know, protectionist policies to some degree because you're requiring companies to come in, give you part of their revenue if they want to come in. There's sort of limited foreign investor rights in the sense that you have to hire certain people and you have to give the government a big piece of your revenue and stuff like that. But it ultimately worked out because now Norway has an oil company. They have Norwegians mostly staffing staffing it. And it's one of the better oil companies in the world in terms of extracting oil. And it just happens to be that the oil profits go to sort of the general treasury and, you know, that investment is socialized to the people, right? Um, and so stuff like that, where you require companies to come in and hire people from your country, you do take taxes and invest those taxes, hopefully wisely into things that are, you know, diversifying and good for your country um, and that cultivate that sort of high skilled domestic population so that you don't just have like, for instance, like Exxon come in, it's all like Americans and fucking Europeans coming in and living in Malaysia for, you know, several years and you don't really hire very many Malaysians and turns out Malaysia doesn't really get a ton of that, you know, money or, you know, uh, results of any of that domestic wealth. A lot of it just goes abroad, right? Which doesn't really help um, Malaysian people as an example. I'm not, I don't know if Malaysia is a good example of this not working out, but um, it's just not a great, uh, it's not It's not great when that happens. So some forms of protectionism are, are probably good, like domestic subsidies, you know, labor requirements, you know, st stuff like that, I think is, are, are good ideas. Uh, were institutions kind of like the World Bank and IMF that were, uh, I, I don't know the exact history of these loans and these institutions. Would these institutions have failed in uh, cultivating those nations, and or were they like trying to exploit globalism as a way to extract wealth from these countries? I think this is a like something. Yeah, I think you've discussed, but I'm just not familiar. Well, yeah, I mean, it just depends on the framework you're using. Like, I think the best model to understand why the IMF and like World Bank does or like did the things it did and does the things it does today isn't like the more conspiratorial like socialists or like right-wing populist of like these countries are just trying to come in fuck over these other countries take all the money and leave right um i think the best example i mean the best way to frame that is probably that these countries are or these uh, institutions had just like mistaken assumptions of how to cultivate wealth and a lot of those assumptions have changed over time right so like the imf today endorses things like I'm describing, like the IMF endorses things like capital controls, right? Welfare spending, um, not cutting certain forms of government spending. Like, hey, if you want to balance your budget, that's great, but don't cut education spending, right? Don't just b destroy all of your fucking public investment just because you want to balance a budget, right? In but bank, in the past, oh, you know, that's what they, yeah. um, in the past, just... that's what they tended to do. It was like, hey, get rid of all your capital controls, get rid of all your you know, a significant portion of like your state investment in health and education and, you know, stuff like that is just not, uh, there's a very mixed reception of IMF and like World Bank investment because of this uh, conditional financing that led to some of these government services being, uh, you know, routed out. And there's some better and worse examples. I mean, there's, you know, some examples of maybe the IMF succeeding or the World Bank does a lot of development aid now, which is mostly considered positive, but, um, yeah, I mean, I just, you know, I, I think that the the, 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 the the sort of pre-2000, or you could say even like maybe pre-2010 IMF of just like deregulate, you know, get rid of a lot of your government expenditure and stuff. And I don't know, that's not really, doesn't really create the best uh, structures for long-term economic success. It doesn't seem like. So. It seems like austerity policy in general has um, just like died entirely. Do you agree or disagree with that? Um... I mean, among the mainstream economists. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, like, there are some countries that still, like, really value a balanced budget. Like, I think that uh, the Netherlands is an example. Um, I think even Norway. I mean, Norway typically uh, values, like, a balanced budget. And there, there are different countries that do. I mean, even, like, developing countries. Like, I think 
I want to say Bangladesh is like the, or maybe Nepal. It's like Bangladesh or Nepal is like the one country in the world that has no outstanding debt or like very, very little outstanding debt. Um, but that, I mean, those are few and far between, right? So I, I agree. I mean, even Trump, like Trump, I mean, Trump's a Republican, but he passed $3 trillion worth of stimulus, right? That's not austerity. You also have austerity. to be careful that like the USD is a world reserve currency. It gives us a lot more flexibility with monetary mm -hmm. policy than other countries around the world. Well, no, that's totally true. But again, like I think that the uh, sort of neocon, I mean, Bush, Bush handled a recession. The way he handled it was like a very, very small bailout of uh, different uh, sort of equity markets, right? But Bush didn't do like a ton of stimulus targeted towards regular people. Um, but Trump did. I mean, Trump did the PPE uh, loans, direct payments, right? Stuff like that. Um, I just think that that's, I mean, that you could argue that that's good or bad, right? I, I just think that it's a, a sign that kind of what Forethought is saying is that the sort of austerity style politics of uh, in reaction to, you know, 20, um, uh, to, to 2008 and 2009. I mean, that, that stuff just didn't really seem to work. And it um, certainly wasn't uh, very uh, successful. So, I mean, it just fell out of style for sure. Uh, totally unrelated and sort of random question that I've had written down for a while that I've been meaning to ask an economist. Um, it okay. seems like uh, economics uh, as a field is just totally uninterested in the day-to-day -day pe behavior of like actual human beings. Is that um, what behavioral like, econ is all about? Behavioral econ is like super new. So I'm just like kind of wondering uh, what is changing in like that you're seeing in the industry or in the research. Because it seems like so much of personal finance should be dominated by economists in some way. It seems like they should have the most insight, but it's always like finance gurus. Yeah, well, keep in mind too that like <laughs> finance and econ are two totally different things that arguably have nothing to do with each other. Like an economist doesn't know anything necessarily about finance and a guy that works in finance doesn't know anything necessarily about econ. This is definitely true. So, I mean, your, your thought, so your question is like, what's been changing about economic uh... yeah, I feel like um, personal finance like should be a branch of economics that like should be like really well studied because it's driving so yeah. much of economics now I mean that's why behavioral economics exists well to some degree it is right so I mean like some economics people will say that or even some finance people will say like finance is just a branch of economics but obviously the disciplines have been segregated at most universities so you don't get much cross-pollination um, and that was my experience. I mean, I studied both in college and um, kind of what Destiny is saying is totally true. Like there was a lot of people in my economics program that didn't really know a ton about finance and certainly vice versa. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, that's that's unfortunate, but there, there probably is an argument that, you know, if you're if you're going to study like finance, you should probably have a few basic economics courses. And, you know, if you're going to study economics, you should probably have some some basic finance courses because they they're really related right like someone like uh, like uh, like for instance someone like rage pope for instance right you know he has a huge amount of finance knowledge and economics knowledge and being able to synthesize those two things is valuable when you're talking about policy because you know finance for a lot of economic regulation is sort of the ground the ground level view and the sort of actual individual implications of economic policy you don't really learn that in a lot of economics discussions. But if you're a finance guy, you're very familiar. Like, oh, this regulation, fuck, it's going to do exactly this or that to my business, right? Um, and you might like it or not like it, but just that understanding is, is I agree, that, that understanding is pretty valuable. Um, when it comes to, like, the personal influence of uh, economic policy, is there, I've heard this idea, but I don't know if it's true, is there merit to the idea that um, inflationary uh Increases in inflation cause a change in thinking amongst people, so they just stop participating in like competitive economics. They like stop shopping elsewhere. They just assume prices have soared everywhere. So, um, sorry, I still have COVID brain. Can you re repeat the question? Oh yeah, sure. Um, is there merit to the idea that as inflation increases, uh, the average consumer just assumes that as prices increase, there is no merit to comparing prices across the market? Oh, I don't know. I mean, so basically if there's broad-based inflation, then comparing like comparing the price level, like the PPP style stuff of like Argentina and the US, something like that doesn't really make as much sense. Oh, wait, hold on. Like the under normal circumstances, a person goes to a coffee shop, they buy a coffee um, and right. they, they see their price increase. They might say, okay, this coffee shop is getting too expensive. I'm going to look at other coffee shops. Um, one of the reasons given for tamping down on inflation so hard is that uh, as inflation increases, people just stop 
looking and comparing prices at all. I don't know if there's any merit to that idea. Oh, um, I mean, I don't, I've never heard that before. That does sound Wait, pretty that odd. I mean, like comparing prices. Is that what we said? Yes. I imagine that's it sounds like Forthought a, is saying it's going to be a function of like um, th there's going to be probably different types of liquidity measured in markets in terms of like substitution from one product to another. So like, for instance, like gas is something that is very easy to substitute because you see the prices outside of it is easy to drive to a gas station or whatever. Um, but like, I'm pretty sure that like stores are pretty aggressively price match each other. Like from my memory, I mean, I, I don't know if like milk is going to be dramatically priced different from like one store to another, like down the street. I think that consumers are pretty savvy when it comes to. Um, right. price of products that they purchase quite often where they have access to multiple uh, people to buy from. That's my assumption. Okay. Right. Right. It sounds like it sounds like what you're saying is basically that if inflation, if kind of inf if, if there's like broad based increases in the price level, then people will kind of just be like, man, what the fuck's even the point of shopping around? You know, because everything's going up anyway. Um, I do think, I think like a little counterintuitively, I do think people unironically, I think they will measure their economic anxiety sometimes based on what pundits or politicians are telling them. Um, I thought there was one study about this a while ago that had to do with people, yeah. like how you felt the economy was going, like tracked more closely with your like political party affiliation than any economic indicator. Um, and I'll still meet yeah. people that are saying today, like, oh no, like gas prices are still super fucking high. And it's like, really, have you filled your car up at all lately? Yeah. I haven't seen that anywhere. Um, but, but people, because they hear it and they're politically inclined, you know, they want to believe a certain thing about the economy, yeah. you know? Yeah. Well, people are just not very well informed on most issues, and people are also very uh, sort of self-centered in their thinking. Like, sure, uh, but I think instance, one of my, I think you'd imagine that people would know some of those things. Like, is the economy better or worse for you right now? Rather than going to what like a political pundit told them, you'd think they'd know. I mean, I would assume that, but I don't know. I mean, because I, I think it, I think it generally is basically just your party identification and probably some like independent centrist style thinking. Like, for instance, I had an uncle who said. He's like, he, he voted for Biden, right? But he said, he was like, oh man, I just, I don't know about Biden. I think I might vote for Trump. Now already this is a pretty, like from our perspective, a pretty weird person. Because it seems weird the idea that someone would just flip from voting for Biden, from Biden to Trump, because they're very different people. Mm -hmm. But his reasoning was, well, you know, my life, like my life just hasn't really gotten that much better mm -hmm. since Biden became president. And that was his only reason. He's like, I just feel like I'm kind of in the same place mm -hmm. as I was three, two, three years ago. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, well, fuck. I mean, I could tell him like, no, Biden's done all this cool shit. But to be fair, it's like, yeah, I mean, I guess if you're like a middle aged person that works at a restaurant, I, I don't know what Biden's done directly for you specifically. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't own an electric car like you're not doing, you know, you, you didn't qualify opinion, for this is where one of those yeah. things like a sovereign wealth fund would be super advantageous because like if the country was doing better as a whole, you could just look at a fund and see it grow. You know, you'd know directly. And I do think, yeah, I, I don't have a study to prove this, but I do feel like one way that people get a feel for the economy is by looking at like their 401ks and pensions. When they see those numbers go up and down, it probably yeah. heavily influences them for how they feel about things. No, that's totally true. I mean, that's why, I mean, unfortunately, right, uh, I think sovereign wealth funds could also align like uh, almost political motivation as well, right? Because what a lot of leftists will say, rightly so, is that the stock market going up doesn't really mean a lot to the average person because mm -hmm. it doesn't, Yeah. right? Most people don't own stock, right? They don't give a fuck about what happens in the stock market. But like if we had a sovereign wealth fund that issued a, you know, kind of a single universal share to people, kind of like Matt Brunig, advocates for mm -hmm. well then you could go into your like government run you know fucking american sovereign wealth fund account you could see the value of that increase or decrease over time yeah. you could see the dividend check that you get mm -hmm. every quarter right i mean yeah so i agree there's there's a uh, there's a lot of um almost like a class warfare style language yeah. that could be addressed by just having a more equitable distribution of capital income and wealth in general mm -hmm. um and things like a sovereign wealth fund could help alleviate that i mean i think that um like i don't think it's a coincidence that you get high levels of polarization in america at the same time when we have like very high levels of inequality yeah because you know you might look at the 50th percentile and look at you know hey median wages over time and sure that number is going up but inequality has also gone up which means that you know when leftists point out or even like right-wing populists point out that the incomes for like low income people hasn't gone up a ton over time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's true, right? And uh, that's, uh, you know, that's really unfortunate. So, you know, government policy, welfare and stuff could hopefully uh, help. One advantage also of sovereign wealth funds is that uh, it's not really welfare. It seems like Americans just don't like the word welfare yeah. or getting welfare. Yeah. And, you know, 
Like, there's a funny poll I saw recently, which was like, do you support uh, more welfare benefits? And it's like 20, 30% of people. But it's like, do you support more assistance to poor people? And it's like 80% of people support that. It's like, well, these are obviously the same thing, mm -hmm. right? But people just have yeah, this Yeah, it's like pulling on the ACA versus Obamacare or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? So I think that's like, not only don't call yourself a socialist, but don't say you're advocating for more welfare. Just say you're advocating for more assistance to poor people, right? Uh, so that you can, you know, get away from uh, just that weird negative association people have. I mean, to be fair, part of the reason people don't like welfare in this country is because... Our welfare systems are designed pretty terribly, but um, you know, if we if we designed them better, people might also not uh, hate them so much. <laughs> but that's a that's a long term project, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. When it comes to, I guess, I'm just gonna spitball some random economics questions I've had pinballing around in my head. Um, yeah, was the economic recovery and like the policies we put in place with um, the mass checks? the generous unemployment benefits was that cons like now that we've had some time was that like the kind of the best it co could have been because it seems like it has done a really miraculous job bouncing back mm -hmm. the economy so quickly yeah i mean i would say so i don't know i i'm pretty uh, like i put a poll on my twitter i don't know it was probably several months ago and it was like would you rather i think it, i think the question was something like you know would you rather have like 4% unemployment with 6% inflation or 6% unemployment with 4% inflation or something like that. And most people picked the lower um, inflation over the lower unemployment. And I don't know, because I, I hear a lot of language. This was several months ago, okay. um, I think. But uh, I don't know. I was thinking, like, seeing the results and seeing how people th kind of feel and think at this kind of present moment in time, it doesn't seem like most people agree with that. It seems like most people would rather have like a job in in an environment where inflation is, you know, 6% instead of 2% than, you know, risk not like having a much higher chance of not being employed than having low inflation. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because obviously you end up with more significant local losses when unemployment's high and inflation's low versus moderately higher inflation, but low unemployment. Um, Here's the and real so, oh, God. Yeah, go on. I was say, the real question is, how is unemployment still so low? What's going on? How's the unemployment still so low? Yeah. I mean... We've been jacking uh, up interest rates for a while now. People keep getting mad. People keep saying that the huge unemployment surge is coming, but it seems like it hasn't happened yet. Um, there are the tech layoffs, but I... Are, is there any economist that's actually worried about the tech layoffs? People keep saying it's doom and gloom, but I'm pretty sure they hired a fuck ton of people yeah. over COVID. I don't know if it actually matters that, like, fucking Facebook and uh, Google are laying people off. Like, are, is there going to be some yeah. huge wave of unemployment, or? I mean, I don't. In software, I don't think so. Um, yeah, the market I, is just so unsat. There's so much work left to be done in general. That feels. I don't, it does I don't feel think... like in general. This is just going to be an anecdotal, like a feeling, feeling from being through airports and stores and late night everywhere. It really feels like we have like not enough people to run our shit right now. Like we are starving right. for workers in all sectors of the economy. Well, but it's also, there seems to have been a significant, it's like three kind of main things, right? One is obviously a million people died. So there's a lot of workers who died. Uh, and like, I don't think know. there's not any workers, right? Most of them are probably old and out of the workforce, right? Well, it's like just a, you could probably imagine like a few hundred thousand like working age people lost sure, their, sure, that's true, their probably, lives, yeah. obviously. Right? Like so that's some, I wouldn't say that's most of it. I think most of it is the other two things, right? Okay. Which is, um, it seems like for one reason or another, there was like a significant change in employment preference. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the labor shortages you're seeing in specific industries, right? Um, or at least it's more pronounced in specific industries like hospitality and, mm -hmm. and, and retail and restaurants, like these kind of like historically lower wage, more like high turnover jobs. People mm -hmm. just don't want to do them at all anymore. Um, I even heard a, I was reading a story the other day, or maybe I talked about it on stream or something that Amazon's, um, Amazon literally, um, part of their strategy for warehouse um, placements is like, we want to place uh, warehouses in areas that are decently populated, but we don't want them to be so populated that Amazon isn't an employer of choice, right? So a lot of the times Amazon warehouses are in these counties that have like 20 or 30,000 people. Mm -hmm. But in part because of the reasons that I'm saying, um, and in part because of Amazon strategy, Amazon is actually having a hard time finding workers because they've actually cycled through like the entire fucking local labor market in some of the areas yeah. that they operate in because so many people just quit and don't ever want to go back. And there's and literally so no people preferences. left. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah, and another, another part of it is a lot of people just enough. retired, right? Like labor force participation is still labor, labor force participation is still uh, a decent degree lower than it was pre-pandemic. Yeah, and I a feel lot of like that there is was, just people retiring. We, we, I feel like we've been talking for a long time about like the boomers need to quit, the boomers need to quit, and we always think they're going to, but then they keep working yeah. and working, and then it feels like COVID was an opportunity for a lot of older people to find like, oh, okay, I am exiting the labor market. I'm done with this. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, a lot of it was like, hey, my house is worth like 50% more than it was three years ago. I've got a shitload of money in my inflated 401k. Like, I can retire today on $3 million or something like that. And then I can, you know, just leave and not really give a shit, right? And yeah. um, a lot of people made that decision. It's totally rational for them to make that decision. And arguably, I mean, like you're saying, a lot of people were saying one of the problems with the baby boomers is they're taking up all these middle and upper management positions, mm -hmm. right, for longer than they should we would expect get them or we would want, out. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, get rid of these fucking boomers from their jobs, right? And so, you know, and and so to some degree that could be a that could be positive for many people, but like um, we're I'm looking at, at it now, this 25 like rough transitory period where we've got a lot of old people that we kind of have to take care of until they die. And they're living like longer right. than ever and everything. And our social security age might be set too low. And there's like these retirements and yeah. pensions. Like, yeah, it's a lot to deal with. I'm looking at it here. It looks like labor force participation amongst prime age workers mm -hmm. is higher than it was pre COVID. Yeah, but the surprising. total labor force participation it's probably down quite is a bit. still, yeah, it's still one or two points lower. Um, oh, it's not and, as dramatic um, as that. Well, yeah, I mean, one or two points lower. I mean, you're talking, I don't know, a million, million and a half workers right there. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but I think that's those are kind of the three things. It's like people dying from COVID, um, people just changing their preferences and like reevaluating their their lives, <laughs> um, and and people retiring early. Um, it was is causing this tighter labor market. So, mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, I just think that back to the the Fed question. I'm just not. I don't think there's a I don't think there's a strong case for the Fed more aggressively raising rates just to cause unemployment to bring down inflation. I think it's probably still better for them to more moderately wait, like hey, at 25 basis points every month or two or however often they meet. Um, I think that's a pretty good just, case. Um, because if yeah, you're the arguably. Fed and there's another 2008 crisis and your interest rates are already at one percent, like what can you do there? Like I I want them to have like some interest rates in the chambers, like some tools that they yeah. can use to modify the economy should things turn well, down again. That's fair, but if they raise rates too aggressively, they're creating, they they have a solution for a problem they created, right? Which I'm, where I'm saying is like it's probably better to just not create that problem in the first place, right? Like you don't have to lower interest rates if there's no recession, right? And if you more moderately raise interest rates and tame down inflation over a slower period of time, to me that's probably better than having this almost more like reactionary interest rate policy where it's like, oh, we raised rates a ton, caused a recession. Now inflation's lower, and now we can lower rates again because inflation's lower, right? I mean, with um, how aggressive they've been, the economy's still been firing on all cylinders. So I'm just like, I don't know, it seems, it seems yeah. like the right cause. It's just a matter of how aggressively you raise the rates, right? Like, I think that they should still be coming up because, again, inflation isn't, it's not a solved problem yet. But um, it, it's just, I don't, like these 50 basis points, 75 basis points increases, they've gone away, but the Fed seems to be signaling like a 50 basis point increase because they don't have a, um, they're not satisfied with the rate of disinflation at this point. Um, and the Fed's kind of come out more openly and said that we want to see unemployment go up so that consumption goes down so that inflation goes down. But if we're just talking about the best thing for people in the economy, I'm just not sure if the best thing for people in the economy is basically inflation going from 6% to 2%, but at the same time, unemployment goes from, I think they said it would go maybe all the way up to 7% to see a disinflation of two to three extra points. I just don't know if 7% unemployment is worth like an extra or a, a couple basis point or a couple of points less than inflation. It's, I mean, it's an arguable position either way. Like I think Noah Smith made the argument in an article that, um, that uh, it's a utilitarian argument. Hey, inflation affects everybody, but unemployment is only going to affect the people unemployed. <laughs> and so under a utilitarian framework, right, it's better to have lower inflation and higher unemployment because that doesn't hurt as many people. But Yeah, I was going to ask that um, earlier about the poll about, like, would you prefer higher inflation or unemployment? I would always prefer higher um, inf uh, I'd always prefer higher unemployment because I'm not getting unemployed, right? And I wonder how many people are thinking that yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, like someone like to be fair, like someone like me, it's probably like I'm in commodities and I'm a pretty like 
I guess you could consider me a high school employee. Like I'm probably not going to get laid off because interest rates are going up. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, and so selfishly, it's probably better for the Fed to increase interest rates significantly so that I'm not paying as much for like, you know, groceries and gas and like whatever other stuff. Right. Or like mm -hmm. I could um, like, right. Like, you know, just regular stuff like that. But um, in terms of it, it just seems like a, one of the lessons we've we should have learned. And I think we did to some degree about um, things like almost like a more hyper globalization or having like lower welfare uh, policy or like being uh, more, uh, I think it's hawk versus dove and like hawkish people are more uh, inclined to lower inflation versus lower unemployment. Like it's just that these localized losses are just, they're, re they're really localized, right? And they really hollow out a lot of communities, right? And that even if we have, you know, if we have 7% unemployment rate, um, a guy like me is probably not going to feel that, but it's so disproportionately yeah, weighted because it does in certain get, areas. Yeah, I agree. Right. It's like climate change, yeah. right? When people are like, who cares about one or two degrees? And it's like, well, this is, it's not one or two degrees, um, you know, averaged over the entire planet. It's going to be some places aren't changing at all. Some might change by four or five degrees, which is significant, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like some countries, like a country, like, I don't know, like a country like Canada might not be as affected as a country like Indonesia. Like mm -hmm. Indonesia is going to fucking like half the country will be underwater, yeah. <laughs> but like Canada might be mostly okay. Um, and so I, I don't know. I just like, I think it was, a, I can't remember what the report was, but I think that was the report was like to lower unemployment or to to lower inflation to 2%, we would need to see like 7% unemployment. And it's like, fuck man, that is like a lot of extra people unemployed. And, um, and we don't have like a really good, it, it would maybe be easier if we had a good welfare system, but we don't like sure. these people would just be fucked, right? Yeah. We, they wouldn't be getting very good unemployment assistance. They wouldn't get a lot of welfare assistance. Mm -hmm. We don't have a universal healthcare system. Like maybe they'd be on Medicaid if they fell you know, into a, you know, a low enough income for their household. But like it, I just don't know if that's, I don't think that's worth it. I mean, maybe there's a great argument for it, but I'd probably prefer a more, uh, I guess a more dovish, uh, more like unemployment focused fed at this point. Um, and I guess politically it might be more advantageous as well. Cause uh, a lot of people have said that, uh, the midterm, the lackluster Republican midterm result is because yeah, inflation was high, but unemployment was also low. Mm -hmm. So it seems like people might, people might be more, reactionary when they're unemployed versus when they're employed, sure. but inflation's higher than it should be. Mm -hmm. um, which, uh, you know, I mean, that's conjecture to some degree, but it kind of makes sense to me when I think about it. Um, when it comes to the Fed as a political entity, do you think they should ever be held accountable to like any sort of popular vote? Because I, I just no. don't think they should. That's never going to happen. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, I think that it's, I think there's a strong argument for depoliticizing and like having like operationally independent to at least some degree economic institutions like i think that i think a lot of welfare policy should be central like centrally administered and relatively operationally independent like it shouldn't be as discretionary um like for instance like uh social security is not discretionary right they don't vote on like funding social security every single year but a lot of other welfare policies they do um and I think it'd probably be better to have a more like universal and non-discretionary welfare system that's centrally administered than having the completely terrible framework that we have now where it's like, I, I thought about doing a video, but the reason I didn't do this video was because it, it would literally be too hard to research. I thought about doing a video to demonstrate how complicated US welfare policy is by taking a journey on how to get food stamps in every single state because every single fucking state has different rules and regulations and thresholds for, and, and, and benefit payouts for getting food stamps. Yeah, you have a we really have this... big problem when you have like, when you turn on the radio in the United States and you hear like, oh, contact these lawyers to make sure you're getting your full social security benefits. And it's like, what? <laughs> Like, right, that's our, that's our right. government. Is it, really, is it really that complicated? Like you can't even get like something you've paid into your whole life? Like that's kind of insane. Right, right. I mean, it's, and it's just, like unemployment insurance is another good example where like the boosted unemployment insurance was great, but so many people didn't qualify for it who thought they did. And so many people weren't able to get unemployment insurance basically because of all these different bureaucratic hurdles mm -hmm. that you have to go through to qualify for it. And it just shouldn't be like that. You know, if you want to have a good unemployment system, just, just, just give people money when they lose their job. Like, fuck, that sh just shouldn't be that complicated a concept, right? <laughs> but, um, but it, but it is. I mean, because part of that's the motivation of, like, we have a federal government, so we don't have we don't have a lot of centrally administered things. But it seems like our best government services in America are the centrally administered ones, right? Things like Medicare, Social Security, 
right? I mean, people really like those programs in part because they're simple and they're centrally administered. And so there's not like, like there's not huge d different qualification standards for social security depending on what state you live in. That's just stupid. That's like the dumbest way to fucking do welfare. Um, you know, I just don't get, uh, I get the logic behind it, but the logic isn't like how to, how to, what do you call it? The, the, the logic was never like, how do we make the best administered welfare system? Or at least it doesn't seem that way. It's just uh, like, how do we decentralize these institutions? Because we're skeptical of like federal authority over certain things. And that's not, uh, it just doesn't seem to work out that way. So. Okay. Well, I got nothing else. Thanks for answering my questions. No problem. Poor thought. Well, I got to go. I got to go to the gym. Destiny, it was really good talking to you. I will um, definitely um, uh, reach out to... I'll, I'll, I'll DM Matt Brunig to see if we can get that epic lay socialism conversation um, set up. I think it'd be interesting, if only for me. If only for the audience of one. Um, <laughs> but it was good talking to you guys. All right. Have fun. Be careful. Buddy. Yeah, no problem. Uh, see ya.